Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another of HydroTerra's webinars. Today, we've got a presentation from CSIRO on what's known as Aqua Watch Australia, which is a near real time water quality monitoring and forecasts at national scale. Well, that's the aspiration for it. We've got several presenters. We've got Dr. Alex Held, Dr. Tim Malthus, and Dr. Klaus Junk, um, along with myself. So a big field of experts today. Before I get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land. And for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. All right, a little bit about our speakers and their organisation. For those of you who may not know what CSIRO stands for, it's the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation and it exists to help the Australian economy and the Australian environment, and they've been going for a long time and they do great work. There's many different units within CSIRO, and today's presentation actually cuts across two of those units, one which is known as space and astronomy, and that's where Dr. Alex Held is from, and then the second unit is environmental unit and that's where Tim and Klaus are from. So we're lucky to have such a great combination of people, a little bit about their expertise. So Alex is one of Australia's leading earth observation experts. He's the mission lead for AquaWatch and director of earth observation infrastructure. In his tenure at CSIRO, Alex has overseen the establishment of the new radar satellite, NOVASAR-1, as one of Australia's newest national research facilities. Leads the development of innovative science in remote sensing and drives the development of spatial technology and data analytics to support sustained Earth observation and measurement of our planet's ecosystems. Alex also mentioned that he's famous for having a planet named after him. Not many of us can claim to have a planet. He did say it's a minor planet. It's called the Held Planet. So that was interesting. And he's been with CSIRO for more than 30 years. So a great period of time to be spending in one place. Dr. Tim Malthus. Tim is a senior principal research scientist in the Environment Business Unit with over 30 years experience in remote sensing of water quality with a focus on optics, calibration and validation, field spectroscopy and sensor development. Tim is a co-creator of CSIRO's patented hydrospectra near surface sensors for the measurement of water quality parameters. We're going to have a bit of a look at some of that today. As part of the AquaWatch Australia mission, he leads the in-situ sensor networks work package, working with optical and electronic engineers and scientists overseeing the challenge of development and deployment of sensor networks at wide spatial scales. And finally, Dr. Klaus Junk. Klaus is a lead scientist in the field of water quality modelling and holds the position of Principal Research Scientist at CSIRO Environment Business Unit. Klaus leads CSIRO's modelling water ecosystems team in addition to work package lead for AquaWatch, which focuses on modelling and forecasting. He's got over 25 years of experience in Europe and Australia, and he specialises in hydrodynamic and water quality modelling of lakes and rivers. I think Klaus is a bit of an example of where you can go to many different places with science. He started off as a geophysicist, um, decided he didn't want to work with rocks and has since gone on a journey using a very strong analytical brain. Um, so without further ado, 
just a couple of things administrative. We love your questions. So today, if you want to raise a question, just use the Q&A button at the top of your screen. And I will read those questions out at the end of the presentation. Why does Hydroterra like to do these webinars? We like to share knowledge, we like to facilitate education, and we like to work with industry leaders. And certainly this AquaWatch program is a true leadership program. Um, you know, it's a great aspiration to be able to try and forecast water quality. And it's also a great aspiration to try and link satellite data and in situ sensing um, in the one into the one system. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to our CSIRO participants today. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Richard. Uh, I might start with a few um, sort of high level uh, description of what AquaWatch and the vision we're trying to fulfill here. But I wanted to also begin by acknowledging traditional owners of the land and waters that we're meeting on today and uh, pay our respect to their elders past and present. Thanks, next slide. So um, AquaWatch has been going only a year um, and uh, the, our ambition is to operate it a little bit like you would see the, the weather forecast um, on your phone and, and provided by the Bureau of Meteorology. So sort of the catchphrase that become popular is a weather service for water quality. Um, we're really into also very much focused on supporting uh, Australia and many other countries contributing to their sustainable development goals and es especially those associated to water and sanitation. Next slide, please. Um, and these are some of the ambitious uh, goals and, and ways we want to support um, uh, 3 billion people worldwide um, that really still don't have access to clean water and sanitation uh, in, and uh, support those who are concerned about coastal water quality impacts on, on um, uh, industries like um, tourism, but also aquaculture and natural ecosystems like the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, as well as uh, supporting uh, early warning, perhaps for uh, problems that might cause fish kills in inland water bodies, like we've seen in Australia a number of times, but also in other developing countries looking after uh, water quality, uh, including potential uh, fish kills due to harmful algae blooms that affect uh, coastal and uh, uh, fish, fish populations and aquaculture quite frequently and more frequently over time. So uh, next slide, please. Um, the ambition then is to bring a lot of technologies together that um, some of which and many of which have already been developed, um, but have not, not been brought together into one big system. And this is basically a graphic that sort of tries to explain that um, where we're bringing in uh, the in sensor networks in situ sensors that are located across different water bodies, surface water bodies and coastal water bodies already existing in Australia or and new ones that we hope to add to, to the list with um, satellite uh, imaging technologies from where a number of our scientists and experts can derive some metrics of water quality um, and quantitative measurements of water quality, but at a larger sort of synoptic scale and uh, and then provide and also bring in some more uh, modeling and, and, and simulation capability so that uh, the hope is we will be able to provide um, forecasts and early warnings two or three days if if not longer so that people can have um, a, 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 the opportunity to make decisions around water quality and, and doing something about uh, the water quality before it hits uh, a fish farm or goes down the, the river. Thanks very much. Next slide. We launched, as you can see, this mission. Uh, mission is like a very large program in, in, the, in the CSRO nomenclature. It's a very ambitious 
multi uh, business unit cross organizational program, which also aims to bring in um, a number of partners from outside the organization to really tackle some of these key, really important challenges and, and, and problems. Uh, we were launched uh, almost a bit over a year ago when we had the UN World Water Day. Uh, some of us were here at the, at the shores of Lake Burley Griffin with uh, Minister Husik and Minister Plivisek and uh, a local uh, minister of the ACT to launch AquaWatch here. At the same time, some of us were at the United Nations, also um, including AquaWatch is one of the Australian commitments to the um, action agenda around water at the UN. As you can see, a number of photos there. We included also as part of the Australian delegation, a strong uh, component of First Nations um, representatives also interested in water. Next slide, please. So again, showing this in a, in a graphical form is we want to bring in together in situ sensors, a dense networks of sensors, find ways to relay the data from uh, perhaps often re uh, remote areas across Australia into a single data system, as we call it, the AquaWatch data system, but also bring in satellite information uh, from existing satellites that we can tap into from, from the US, from NASA, for instance, or from the European uh, Copernicus program and then also add the ecosystem models that then allow us to do a lot of the processing and the forecasting that we would like to be able to do in AquaWatch. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, we also have teams working on how best do we make this information available to different types of users, right? So you might in, imagine technical water managers in a water utility or in a water agency wanting the data presented in a certain way, but you might also as a, as a, in the, uh, present the data in a, in a w different way to community groups, First Nations people who want to make decisions about whether they go for a swim or go for fishing and things like that. Uh, and so it's also about how do you make this data as, as, as easily uh, understandable, but also how, as accessible as quickly as possible so people can, can react if there is a water quality issue nearby. Next slide, please. Just, just before you do, so yep. these ecosystem models, what do you mean by that? Is it an ecosystem as in a natural ecosystem or is it an ecosystem of technologies that are yep. being integrated? I, Klaus, Klaus will go in, in a lot more detail into this. Uh, do you want to just quickly answer this question? And then, yeah, so then I'll pass to you. Yeah. The ecosystem models in, in, in the sense of um, process-based models which can solve differential equations on the technical side or on a non-technical side, uh, in principle, models which can describe how water quality changes over time driven by external factors. That's in principle what we look at. Thanks for that. Thanks, Klaus. <clears throat> so the whole data system, which we call the AquaWatch data system, is basically um, being set up as, as we speak. We leveraging of an existing technology also developed in, by CSRO in, con in conjunction with, for instance, Geoscience Australia. Um, called the uh, Open Data Cube, and our implementation is called EASY, which stands for Earth Analytics and Science Innovation Platform, which brings a lot of these different data streams together um, and allows us to also tap into thousands and thousands of satellite images that uh, sit on the cloud on Amazon servers um, around the world. So. The, the platform, and if there's more questions, happy to describe that in a bit more detail, but it runs on the cloud. Um, and it's it's like, it's basically sim emulating a massive supercomputer, which then brings in all these different data sets uh, from in situ sensors, satellite data, and then runs also some of them, will, will run some of the modeling te uh, technologies to then provide that data uh, as a map interface or a data stream. 
Next slide, please. One way we are really learning by doing this, because this has never been done before, bringing all these different data sets together, is by setting up a number of pilot sites across Australia and some internationally as well. Um, they not only help us on a technical side, how to figure out how to bring these different data sets together and place some instruments in different water bodies, but also develop partnerships with communities or local agencies that manage water bodies around Australia, as well as some international partners who also have quite unique water quality issues and problems that we want to learn about as well. You, I think the next slide will show you a map um, where some of these sites are. Um, apologies, we lost the, the, the map for <laughs> Australia there, but I think we have so many pilot sites, you can sort of see roughly what uh, where those are. Um, you're still trying to have a few more in Northern Australia and in, in Western Australia, but um, there's quite a few that are both um, inland water bodies, but also at the coastal zone. And there's a new, a few new sites popping up uh, overseas, like in Vietnam, uh, in California, in Chile, we're supporting the, the salmon industry there, for instance as well as now one uh, in the UK, looking at some of the river flows there into, into the uh, English Channel, and a new one in, the, in Italy uh, off the coast of Venice, which has some, a lot of pressures on, on water quality at that area. If someone wants to uh, include a site that they've already got, where they've got water quality data, is it, how should they yeah. do it? In the uh, week? Yeah. Please reach out to us. Yes, um, we're, we're keen to collaborate with as many potential users and learn from bringing all these different data sets together. As I said, eventually we want to cover the whole country. Um, it'll take us a while to be able to do that, especially be able to forecast and model every water body, that important water body across Australia. And I can see Klaus getting more and more gray hairs doing that, but anyway. Um, the idea is to eventually have, have the whole country covered. So, um, yeah, that's happy to have a conversation about new sites we might want to have. Yep. Next slide, please. And so, yeah, we, we are, of course, not just um, implementing existing technologies, but we still have an active research role, as you know, in CSRO, Innovation Agent Science Agency. Um, we have a number of teams developing new sensors, new technologies, and Tim. Uh, we'll talk about some of those, the uh, Hydra Spectra, for instance. But we also have teams um, helping us develop what might the, a very specialized satellite sensor need to, to be able to do in space that's just focused on water quality uh, monitoring. So next slide, please. And we have a, a really interesting project as well overseas with, with NASA and their Jet Propulsion Lab, um, where we're designing a conceptual study. We don't have this funded as a satellite yet, but a conceptual study of what would uh, a really high performance satellite uh, look like and what sensors we would need to have in that satellite to map uh, at least these three major application areas, um, where we want to be able to discriminate between harmful algae blooms and non-harmful blooms, for instance look at aquatic invasive aquatic vegetation and also map the corals and coral reef a bit better than what we can do with existing satellites at the moment. Next slide, please. What's that uh, the JPL design Dyson imaging? It's, it's, a, it's a very high signal to noise um, spectrometer, an imaging spectrometer as it's called. Uh, which takes very detailed reflectance spectra uh, for each pixel. So each image pixel that you, you, you have on the instrument. Um, Dyson is the name of the actual design of the optics and the, and the sensor and the detector. It's, 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 a, it's a form of optical design of these sensors. Okay. One of, a version of that is already on the space station, by the way, called okay. EMIT. Um, and we're using that to, to learn how to process that data and to see how much information on water quality we can derive from that, for instance. 
And uh, just with respect to the reflectance and being able to pick the difference between mm -hmm. invasive species, I mean, is it really, has it got to that level? You really can do species identification from space? In some cases, uh, yes, uh, not all, because, I mean, the plant, plants look green, I mean, uh, but uh, invasive species also, the harm, uh, algae might have some additional photosynthetic pigments that they use as part of their photosynthesis that give them a very, very narrow but very specific reflectance signature, fingerprint, that we can then use to identify that species or that type of, of vegetation. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, uh, the, the, the traditional bot botanical um, taxonomy, of course, you can't do that from space because sometimes the only difference is a pet, the different size of the petals in the flower or whatever. Yeah, we yeah. can't do that yet. But I think at a broad, in broad scale, uh, some of the major uh, groups of plants and, and species sometimes we can pick them up so simply because they're they're different in their reflectance and so something like coral coverage is that looking at the bleaching is that when we hear estimates of bleaching is that how they do that they yeah they do that also already with with some of the the coarser i mean the the, the normal multi-spectral satellites what we hope to do with this this sort of design is to discriminate much more precisely, not only bleached and unbleached coral, but the diff uh, sometimes they, there is a underwater you get confused between rocks and corals and and different other benthic materials like algae and other things. So with this sort of design, we hope to be able to separate those different uh, underwater features a lot better than what we, you can do at the moment. Okay. So what resolution are you talking about? Like um, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think this one is being designed to map at 18 meter pixels. Um, remember that because we are, we're, we're doing a, a this, I mean, these satellites fly hundred kilometers an hour over, over, over earth in a low earth orbit. Um, we only have a certain amount of time during which we can collect the, the photons coming back to the sensor. So, um, there is this trade-off of signal to noise and detectability and fidelity of the instrument versus the the size of the area that, that you can collect over uh, pixels. Um, so this is the sweet spot of the best uh, optimized spatial resolution versus the uh, discrimination capability that we need in a satellite to discriminate these different types of uh, features. Um, so it's it's yeah that's at the moment that's where the technology is um, is at. Um, I'm hoping that in the future, um, as detectors and sensors get better and better over time, uh, we we can go into smaller pixels, and pick up smaller water bodies and farm dams and things like that. But that's the compromise from an engineering perspective at the moment that we can uh, pick get the signal to noise we need, uh, but but still pick up things that are. 80 meters um, as a minimum size. Yeah. So you didn't really explain what CONOPS is. Uh, CONOPS, sorry. The Co concept of operations is sort of a, it's a catchphrase in the, in the space um, operational side. It's basically this, this, this little graph shows that the, the satellite is designed to um, uh, pivot itself to look at one spot for a bit longer as it flies over, right? So that it it move it always looks at the same spot. That increases the signal to noise and the amount of photons we can get for that spot, and therefore it allows us to discriminate things even better. Um, so it it of course would be a very sophisticated uh, sophisticated satellite that at the same time as it's collecting images, it's also um, move uh, swinging a little bit. To always point and loiter of the same point for a few seconds to get a maximum signal. Yeah, makes sense. All right, thanks for that. <laughs> Sorry. So I might pass now to Tim. Um, he will give you mm -hmm. a little bit more information on some of the sensor technologies and the challenges we have to solve there. 
And uh, after that, then uh, I, uh, we pass to Klaus to talk a bit more about the modeling and the forecasting. Sounds good. Thank you. Great. Go Thanks. Yep. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, I think so. Alex has done a great job in identifying, I think, what are the unique aspects of, of the AcroWatch mission. And and its real uniqueness lies in the fact that it's not not only uh, just a satellite mission. It really has this um, uh, this collection of multiple components, uh, which are ultimately leading to forecasting water quality. That's the ultimate aim. So, so it's including not only uh, not only the satellite sensors, but in situ sensor information, um, incorporating that incorporating those into a uh, let's a sort of data engine, call it that, or a data analytics engine. And then um, in integrating those with forecasts, with forecasting models to be able to to make forecasts, and that's the unique aspects of the mission. And I lead the uh, work package, which is looking at in situ uh, sensing technologies. Um, if you go to the next slide, Richard. So, just focusing on on Australia on its own. Um, if we if we're wanting to roll out a network such such as as this across across the continent, I think Australia probably perhaps represents the biggest uh, one of the greatest challenges that we could uh, in terms of its landscape, its remoteness, um, some of the geographic extremes that we have to deal with and complexities. I think it's a great uh, it's a great continent to try and test this. And if, I think if we can crack this nut for Australia, then we can pretty much roll uh, something similar out all around all around the globe. But there is a real challenge here on how you do um, fundamentally roll out a sensor network across a, a, a continent with, with complexity, um, with uh, uh, areas that extend essentially from the tropics to temperate ecosystems, um, very large extremes in weather events, wet season, wet season in the north, which can have significant impacts as we've just seen with Cyclone Megan. Um, so large extremes. Also, you know, we want to um, we want to cover a, a quite a range of water bodies as well. So our end users are indicating interest in, in not only small scale things such as farm dams, but also urban systems, rivers, lakes, reservoirs, estuaries, and, and ultimately to coastal zones. So a whole range of water bodies to, to think about, each with their own individual challenges. And then the, the challenge then is to to do that in a in a, in a means by which it's, it's sustainable, uh, but also um, is you know delivers a robust and failure resistant system. Uh, next slide, thanks, Richard. So we've developed a, a um, we sort of scoped I guess a green paper on this work, which is really identified in order in order to do this in a kind of economically viable way. The Internet of Things is probably the the best approach for this. So a kind of low cost approach to to sensor rollout employing a range of different communication uh communication infrastructures if they're available in particular areas from from things like uh LoRa WAN 5 5G networks um or less and then satellite broadband uh, as well so so just utilizing what's what's present but based on a, essentially a range of of potentially hopefully low cost low cost sensor solutions Next slide, thank, thanks, Richard. There are, of course, a lot of um, a lot of challenges to solve in this particular area. So we've identified quite a number of particular design criteria, and this is essentially we're at the stage of of working towards what might be a sort of uh, another white paper, which is essentially the design the design statement for what um, for what this in situ sensor might look like. And but these are some of the criteria that will have to be met. One around cost effectiveness, um, easy to maintain. It's certainly got to be robust, deliver timely data. It's got to be able to deliver credible data um, such that we can such that we have reliable um, credible data on, upon which to base our, our forecasts. Um, it's designed to be open so that data will be available to to everybody. Um, also representative of the of the general um, geography of Australia. Let's put it that way. Of the water bodies we want to want to cover, um, and also um, a combination of direct communications and, and Internet of Things. Within that, there are then a whole lot of uh, problems to solve or challenges to overcome, and I've kind of ranked these by what I consider the hardest and those which are perhaps the most solvable. Um, but you can see there that um, 
clearly robustness and reliability and maintainability are key things. Uh, making sure different sensors are interoperable, uh, flexible, and and um, cost is always a key key factor. Um, our our intention here is not to is not to reinvent the wheel. We're looking for technologies that essentially are. Uh, that might be existing in, in commercial off the self, shelf sensors, but which are um, cost effective to deploy at scale. Um, and in order to to initiate some of that some of that work, we have a, we have just recently employed external consultants who are going to under, undertake some um, tech surveys with us. So so one study will look at a, at essentially a tech survey of existing and promising low cost sensor technologies. Uh, across both the let's say commercial, uh, what's commercially available and what what's actually um, in the research domain, and do a kind of TRL assessment of those of those different technologies, such that we can sort of understand what's out there, what's promising, um, and are there are there potentially winners within the, those groups of technologies that might work in this this sort of system, and then to to identify those partners who are working in those areas and to work with them um, to encourage them to and perhaps find the funding to to uh, increase the TRLs on those on those particular technologies. The other study is also undertaken, and this addresses some of the some of the questions that have already been asked um, ahead of the seminar. Um, we're also undertaking a survey of existing monitoring um, installations across the country. So certainly, you know, we're not looking to to come in and um, put our sensors in 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 places where perhaps sensors already exist. So we're looking to to find out, you know, what is um, what are the existing installations across the country. Um, if you if you have some, we're certainly very keen to hear from you, and and particularly if you are happy to make make the data from those sensors available. Plus, also, you know, where we might be able to piggyback some of our sensors onto onto our platforms would be really interesting as well. Um, thanks, Richard. Um, so just on those standards yeah. and protocols, are you going to mm -hmm. adopt the Bureau of Meteorology's sort of metadata framework or? Yes, heard. yes, we haven't. Um, we will, yeah, we'll look at a number of those. That there are a whole heap of um, standards and protocols, some around, uh, um, certainly around metadata, around calibration, around um, quality assurance and quality control. I, I would say we're probably relatively new in this game to compared to other groups, but but certainly we need we, we need a whole stack of sort of protocols in place such to assure and essentially to ensure that that data that goes into our our ads system uh is is you know both both credible and and accurate um so so it's, uh, some of it links i guess to that that sort of quality assurance and quality control i hope that answered your question yeah i think it's Absolutely. Enough. maybe mm. the audience make more mm. words. the bureau of meteorology has these publications mm. Mm. The Australian Hydrographers Association developed yep. up a really good um, with... comprehensive set of guidelines that yes into how to install, etc. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've yeah. engaged with them already. Yeah. Excellent. I'll move to the next slide. So I thought I would just round off my small section of this this study just by by highlighting we're talking about two two areas where we are or have been developing sensors. So the first one, which has already been mentioned, is, is this device called Hydrospectra. And this essentially is a low-cost sensor which works a bit like um, what a satellite might work at, work like. So, so it is an optical sensor. It me simply measures the spectral reflectance of water, and that's very much what a, what a satellite uh, intends to do. And from that spectrum, as as Alex was describing, we can then derive information about whatever target we're looking at, be it corals or 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 perhaps algal blooms in in water bodies. Um, there are already scientific instruments which can do this, but they're incredibly expensive. You know, you could pay up to two hundred thousand dollars for a set of instruments which would do the same uh, as this device, uh, which it's less than ten thousand um, dollars. So um, Hydrospectra was really designed to, to measure above surface reflectances and to do so in a continuous continuous manner. So it will be permanently parked at a 
at a, a site of interest um, and it serves the purpose of, of both monitoring water quality at high temporal frequency, so higher frequency than the satellites will view. As such, it then serves as a, as a nice validation point for our satellite data, so we can also um, we can also estimate the reliability of the satellite data. Plus, also um, way back in the first time we started developing this instrument, it really was designed as an algal bloom alerting tool. We were really looking for a device that we could put out on inland water bodies across Australia to alert uh, end users as to when algal blooms might be developing. Um, the cleverness in this device is really in the spectrometer inside it, and, and that has been patented by CSIRO. And the whole idea is, is that because it because it sits above the water, it, it suffers less of the issues we get with biofouling and, and other issues of sensors in the water. Um, so it's, so it, its maintenance requirements are are somewhat lower than those those which actually sit in the in the water, um, and the uh, I should just explain what we have here is is a uh, number of it has a number of fields of view. The device itself, the head of the device, is is what you can see on the top right there. Um, it has a number of fields of view which which um, uh, we me measure the spectrum of light, and, and from that we derive a fairly accurate estimate of of reflectance. We also have some cameras on board the device, one looking up at the sky and one looking horizontally out to give us an idea of the changes in water color. And this is just one example from an installation on the Fitzroy River up in uh, up near Rockhampton, um, just to show you some examples of what those cameras deliver. And already, you know, those cameras deliver quite useful information just in highlighting changes in water quality, as you can see in the differences in color um, caused by differences in tidal state. It, it, this is an, an estuarine part of the river. Um, and just the data on the bottom right are, are just a time series of, of data showing showing uh, a, a comparison between um, chlorophyll estimated using the hydrospectral device versus an in situ measured uh, chlorophyll. We have a pretty good agreement. And this is for another installation. This is in the Spencer Gulf um, uh, down, down towards Adelaide. Um, next slide. Thanks, Richard. So, as Alex mentioned, we have a number of pilot sites um, around uh, around Australia and around the world. This is just an example of some of those deployments and and showing the deployment of hydrospectra. Um, so typically, you know, we can put them on uh, fixed platforms such as the pylons. You can see that's the one on the on the Fitzroy estuary, um, or we can put them on buoys. Um, the, the image top left is is on. Um, the uh, is on the Coburn is on Coburn Sound. Typically, if we put them on a buoy, we will also deploy instrumentation, um, in situ instrumentation as well. So, so on this buoy, there's not only a hydrospectra on the top, which you can see, but there is also um, we've also deployed in situ sensors, uh, which you can't see, of course. Those are coastal installations. The bottom right one shows a shows an installation on a, on a lake, um, Grangetown Dam in New South Wales. We've been working with Hunter Water. Um, just shows a typical example, and where the boys again on a boy, but the boys are uh, less perhaps less robust and uh, um, than compared to the coastal ones. Typical spectra you can see on the top left there. So this is just an example from the installation at Coburn Sound, just for one one month of one month of data, um, and. From that, we can then begin to generate, this is one of our longest deployments, um, and you can see a time series of chlorophyll estimates here in Coburn Sound on the bottom left, um, and a comparison to estimates. The red dots are estimates from Landsat satellite data, and the uh, the fine point data is, is daily estimates of chlorophyll from the hydrospectra sensor. And you can see that generally, over most of the time, the, the two data sets correspond quite well. Um, thanks very much, Richard. And our last very early stage low TRL development is, is that we've been working also on a low cost nitrate sensor. So this is really taking the concepts which are already already proven of optical detection in the UV of, um, of uh, nitrate sensing. Um, some of you are probably fairly familiar with some of the instruments that, that are already available commercially that can do this, um, but trying to do so in a, in a device that is, that is uh, much cheaper. So we're, we're exploiting LED technologies um, and it 
simultaneously trying to account for some of the other signals that interfere with those nitrate detections, uh, be it dissolved organic matter and, and uh, turbidity, uh, as well as temperature. So um, we have a talented, talented postdoc working in this area. Um, and he has developed already a he's uh, developed a prototype, which you can see sort of on the on the bottom right. Um, and we're currently scoping up a, a field deployable instrument. And we and he has also done quite a considerable amount of sort of theoretical development of the device, uh, such that we're we're um, ready to go. Uh, well, um, yeah, we can we can um, be confident that what we've got is a, is a device that will be reliably measure. Um, measure nitrate in the presence of those other interfering compounds um, and um, and uh, once we have the field prototype developed we'll be um, uh, we can retrieve nitrate quite quite accurately um, and thanks so the next slide I think the, the what's your slides. aspiration on the size of the sonde at the end of the day we're going to be able to get down small enough to go into monitoring wells for groundwater applications as well or potentially we're we're currently sort of developing it for a housing which um i guess is is i'm sort of guessing here is about 10 uh 10 centimeters in diameter and and perhaps 20 20 to 25 centimeters long um that's a housing that houses the 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 electronic components you can see top right there plus also the the battery and and uh, other things. I think there is probably the potential for further miniaturization of this. Um, once once we get beyond the our, our plan is to actually field test it in um, cotton uh, in a cotton application where essentially you know urea is being applied or nitrate fertilization is being um, undertaken quite regularly and the concentrations are quite high. It's a nice, uh, they're sort of nicely controlled um, study. So that's where we're looking to really try out a, an initial uh, deployment of this device. Um, we haven't really got to the point of considering considering groundwaters, but I think I think there is scope. I can certainly come back to you. Um, I can get Tarun, the postdoc who's working on this, to come back to you and, and talk about the scope for miniaturization. Oh, that'd be great. We've mm. got a lot sites where we're monitoring um, the, like water authorities, their batch, you know, raw water before it gets treated. And uh, it's quite good because you can get that journey of, um, you know, your nitrogen, et cetera, and then also pick up the algal blooms, but it's a fairly controlled space. You know, it's a structured mm -hmm. pond. Mm -hmm. so it might be a good place to try mm -hmm. it. Yep. Um, Tarun right. has already um, yeah, trialed just the deployment, not not so much of that device, but of of normal, you know, um, typical commercial nitrate sensors from drones, as well. Okay. That's another that's another interesting interesting development too. So with that, thanks. I'll hand over to Klaus for his part on on forecasting. Thanks, Tim. So now we have all our data gathered from the satellite and from in situ sensors, and we. We have to take, make something out of that, uh, model the system, how it develops over time, and predict that in the future. That's our aspiration here. Um, when we come came to to, to AquaWatch, we first had uh, quite quite a number of end user workshops to figure out um, what the needs of different end user groups are, and that word cloud in principle shows you you a whole bunch of things, but it turns out that at the end, they want to have uh, modeling and forecasting for water quality as, as an outcome for them to uh, be able to, well, to have develop mitigation options for the system they're looking at and seeing uh, if there's any early warning um, possibility so they, 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 they can do something in advance or plan into the future. So water quality modeling and forecasting is one of the, 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 the main issues they, they have and they want to get out of, of AquaWatch as a result. Next slide, please. So with this um, predictive data modeling for real-time decisions, 
we would then be able to reduce, as I said, negative impacts of poor water quality. And that's uh, in fire for existing industry, environment and community. That's our goal, uh, where we want to go with, uh, with the modeling and forecasting. Next slide. The forecasting itself, uh, it's a bit opening uh, the door to, to everything. Forecasting of what? Water quality is, th there is no water quality per se. Water quality can be everything. Uh, starting with temperature can be also uh, physical process, hydrology, its salinity, its nutrients, its pathogens, you name it. Um, everything is water quality. So we can't really do everything um, in this in this project. So we have to focus a little bit on specific water quality parameters, which are of high importance um, at the moment, and then widen our uh, aspects, what we what we try to, to, to use. And I've mentioned here uh, on, on these pictures, in principle, four of those major types, which we, in inland water, which we directly can, can see from the satellite, uh, but where we also have data available, because these are the two essential things. We need the, the, the satellite data, we need the in-situ data to do our modeling and forecasting. So we have, um, in a clockwise sense, for example, Blackwater um, here, Lake Victoria, um, which is a high concentration of dissolved organic carbon, uh, which tints the water black. Um, and that has the effect that also microbial interaction will just reduce the the, the the dissolved oxygen. So here we have another example of a constituent which we can measure, D DOC in principle, or the blackness of water. And we can then infer another water quality parameter, which is dissolved oxygen, which we cannot measure by the satellite. On the next one is the, the colorful one is the harmful algal bloom in 2016, the mega blooms um, in Ligume. Um, something which we probably do in a standard way meanwhile from satellite to see how uh, bloom formation is. What we want to do here is also couple that with modeling uh, and see how does that bloom form in different parts of the lake or if the lake is small or in the river, how does it spread um, over time? The next one uh, to the lower right, that's a bushfire event. So that's um, Gippsland Lakes, where we had after the bushfires, a high, high intense um, rainfall, which washed uh, the, the mobilized sediments into the, river, into the river and then into receiving water bodies. Um, that has, of course, a quite significant impact of ecosystems um, along the river, but also in, in the lakes. And that's not only a one-off uh, just during the flood but or during the runoff, but also over longer times because the sediments accumulate and can lead to other problems later on. And finally, uh, a little bit like the, the, the runoff from bushfires is the normal flood uh, conditions, washing sediments uh, into, um, in that case, like Alexandrina and the uh, out into the, in, into, the, into the coastal seas. Next slide. Are you integrating with the sort of hydrologic flood models and that sort of thing? Is yeah, that's the aspiration. We have to do that, especially for the bushfire part. We, we try to, to do that because we need to know uh, the load. The same is valid for plume development um, in the coastal regions where we look uh, how plumes form in the, in the GBR. Um, to do that, we need to know what's the catchment hydrology and how does sediment is in principle uh, transferred from the catchment into the receiving waters. So hydrology plays a big role. Hydrology also plays a big role in, in the problem space which we have to tackle in the modeling and forecast. And that's the, we, we need to monitor across different time scales. If you look at hydrology, that, that's a day to week where things change. Metrology change on a daily or sub-daily um, scale. But for example, internal reaction mechanisms can be very fast. Um, so half-lagal blooms, we need to know 
what's the algal physiology? How do they do they grow under different light, temperature, and nutrient conditions that can change, of course, very rapidly? Um, in all of an hour, we, we, we need to, to be able to, to model that. And it's becoming even worse if you look uh, into mixing processes in, in the water column. Um, these are on a minute time scale. So lake models usually work on time scales internally of a few minutes to resolve turbulent interaction. So, and that makes, of course, a, a quite big problem in, in the modeling to, to get all these aspects together and in the data less avail availability for this, for this. Next slide. Another problem is, is the spatial uh, resolution. Um, that comes into the uh, two ways. One way is the modeling itself. We have to, to use different types of models to resolve, let's say, a big reservoir like, like, like you on the, on the left-hand side, or a very shallow urban lake like Taganong in, in Canberra, um, where we probably don't need a real three-dimensional model, a one-dimensional would do. But we also want to go into smaller scale systems like water treatment lagoons, which are on the size of 100 meters if they are open. Um, and here you see, for example, how, how that looks like in the terms of um, chlorophyll A estimation across these, these systems. And it's not very uniform. So they're, they're local effects. These local effects are very hard to model in principle if you don't have enough data available. And it's getting even harder if you go to very small river reaches um, because the hydraulics of those river reaches are, can be very complex, especially if they are meandering like here in this case, that's uh, the Darling at Menindi. Um, and it also is another, another aspect that data gathering from remote sensing in these very small systems, so uh, very narrow uh, rivers, is sometimes not possible. On the low flow conditions, they might be uh, smaller in width than uh, the satellite resolution is. So we lose the cap capability to observe them from space or only in, in uh, only have the capability to have that uh, spatial resolution in front of uh, the weir dam or next slide please so what we can do at the moment is for here an example for legume we have algal levels on the left hand side which we derive from um, remote sensing we have a 3d 3d models or we can have 3d models or 1d models for uh, hydrodynamics in the lake driven by metrology bathymetry, maybe it's lake level, in and outflow, the hydrodynamics, the physical system is very well known. You can calculate the currents, mixing certification, and then we put on that, on top of that, an algal model. The algal model now makes it, starts making it complicated because we don't know exactly uh, if we if we go there, what cyanobacteria species do we have? So what physiology, what temperature dependence do those species have on the functional class? Um, and here comes in uh, Aquatch uh, or the ambition of Aquatch to be able to, to, to discriminate between species, which would allow us to uh, draw back information about this physiology and uh, get the, uh, the uncertainty of our models smaller. And the red box there, risk analysis for cyanotoxins, that's of course where we want to go. Um, but that's the next step on top of it, because we can't uh, control or see cyanotoxins from space. Um, it's very hard to get uh, consistent long-term data sets to do the modeling directly on it. And it's not very, the causal uh, relations between toxin production and environmental factors are also not very well known. But anyway, we are on the way there from green, yellow to the red to solve those. Next slide, please. Um, and on that path, we use a uh, different system. We use in situ data, that's the colorful dots here, of, in this case, chlorophyll A, uh, cell counts of cyanobacteria and legume. We use modeling to calculate and simulate those cell counts. That's the black line. And we use hydrospectral data um, to 
calibrate our model and see how well the hydro spectra um, shows us what we model and what's measured. These are the blue and black dots. And for like you, this, these are remarkably, remarkably good um, in terms of we can even see daily cycles um, uh, of plume formation uh, reacting directly on the internal mixing dynamics of a water body. Next slide. And that's a uh, blown up um, zoom out version of that one where we can see the daily cycle over how much is that a month, 30 days. Um, the dots again are hydrospectra derived cell cones. The lines are now um, the simulations. And where we now Im implement forecasts um, based on hydrospectra derived data. So we take a one day hydrospectra point, um, throw it into the into the forecast model, and it simulates one of those colorful lines. And then next day we do the same, um, and that results in this variation uh, which we see here. So that gives us a sense of uncertainty which we produce uh, by using a simulation model. Uh, how well can we estimate cell counts or harmful algal bloom development? Uh, in such a like system, which is relatively well monitored, then you have to think, okay, what is necessary uh, to do so if you go to other systems um, where you don't have that many data to calibrate your, your model uh, and go ahead. Next slide, please. The problem is uh, if you want to take those models and scale up, so we can't really throw these models in, in every lake and, and try to solve them because we can't calibrate them. So we, we need to have other means uh, how to do that. Uh, one of those means is we need to have those data and use machine learning, for example, uh, and combine them with the, with the process models to avoid this calibration step. However, if the red hand, the red side on, on the on the right hand side, you see um, available data for different water quality parameters across Australia um, and their, their value, their mean value. Um, and you see the distribution is anything else than uniform. Uh, it's very concentrated on the coastal region. Inland, there's nearly nothing. Well, there are data available, but they are not continuous. They're not really long-term, which we would need to set up. Um, forecasting models. So that's that's our problem um, field now. We need now to see how can we use those models, those and those data which are available from uh, water agencies, water utilities, um, and how can we then general, generalize our um, simulation models in a way that we can deploy them and transfer them from one point to the next and even outside of, of the monitored region. And we start that um, with a very simple uh, water parameters, which we which are very, very well uh, recorded. That's water temperature, that means, all, means also stratification mixing, uh, electrical conductivity, turbidity, TSS. So we have values for those. And then it goes to, to less frequent measured data like chlorophyll I, pigments, nutrients, and potentially toxins and pathogens. And I'll show you some examples on the next slide where, what, we, what we want to do. Um, so that's just a, a summary again. We look at river water temperature as a basic parameter for ecosystems, at chlorophyll I as a proxy for harmful algal blooms in rivers and lakes. And at the moment, uh, also on dissolved oxygen, um, which is uh, derived as a, uh, from persistent certification. Um, and we use that to de determine uh, potential fish kills. Next slide. So the water temperature, we already have relatively good uh, models available uh, for lakes. We saw that on the previous slides, but also for rivers um, um, where we have enough data, we can calibrate them. Here, that's um, uh, the, at the Kiewa, um, just before it goes into the Murray. Um, 
the blue line in the middle, that's the observed data, and the yellow line is the model data. So pretty, pretty, pretty nicely matching. Uh, we, we can use that for forecasting that. And that model in principle takes nothing else than, than air temperature and discharge uh, to forecast that. And air temperature and discharge is usually available on a large scale. So we are able now to do that for, or have uh, trained the model for 300 stations in the mirror darling basin. And we're now looking at generalizing that with machine learning methods um, to be, be able to, to in principle transfer those from the gauging stations to any stream section in the river network. Next slide. For chlorophyll A, we try the same thing, but it's getting harder because we don't have uh, that many data available. Um, however, we have quite a few data, or well, uh, many data available from remote sensing. So here, what we do here is in principle, instead of using a simulation model, um, a process model and in-situ data, we're using remote sensing data and in-situ data to derive a machine learning model to forecast chlorophyll I in rivers. Next one, please. And that's an example um, how we do that. On the left-hand side, if we have a river station um, and grab samples on a hopefully weekly basis, um, then we need to derive from the satellite uh, the chlorophyll A value at that point. Um, however, we can't really use a single point uh, because that would give you uh, quite a big uncertainty. So we use uh, along the river, a line where we extract the um, the inf information from the satellite over 300 meters upstream of the monitoring point. Um, and we use the center line because we have also the problem that we need to specify that system in a way that it works under high flow as well as under low flow conditions. Um, and we're always using water pixels and not than pixels by chance. And if you do so, we get the picture on the right hand side. So the, the red dots are um, seven years of data. Uh, that's the Swan Hill and the Mary. Uh, seven years of data of chlorophyll A on the red dots and the black, uh, black crosses are in principle one day ahead forecasts, uh, one week ahead forecasts of the chlorophyll A uh, using remote sensing data and the trained um, machine learning model. And the gray uh, is the uncertainty of that. So we are getting there. Uh, we can do that only at the moment for, for, the, for the Murray and tributaries, um, uh, but we're trying to expand that to other areas where we have or oh, find enough chlorophyll A data to do so. Next slide, please. As a summary, um, we have a lot of water quality risk problems, which are across large scales. Um, and currently they are only treated localized on an event-based scale. And Aquat is trying with these models and these systems to, to broaden our knowledge and pass them on, transfer that, or with transfer learning, pass them on to other um, positions, other stages, other lakes, other river segments across the continent, and even go on a entire, an entirely continental scale. And for that, we're using so-called hybrid models. So we, we don't uh, only use machine learning um, and guess something, uh, but we constrain that with process, process understanding, so process models, and remote sensing uh, data which gives us the ability to look uh, on a wider scale. And then we can have that holistic view when, where, and why things are happening for some water quality parameters. And that gives us then uh, the possibility to go to water agencies to give them um, that for, for their planning. Uh, we, have a, we can base um, early warning on that. Um, which leads to risk minimization for water utilities, water intake, when do they take the water in and how do they manipulate that. Mitigation strategies can be developed because we, we're not only looking at a single point, but also uh, on a catchment scale probably. 
Uh, yes, I think that was everything I had to tell you for our system. Um, at the moment, if, if it's only trained on our pilot systems. Um, but as you can have seen, we're already starting to expand that to, to a larger regional at least system uh, with the aspiration to go in continental at least and including other water quality parameters as those relatively simple ones uh, which I have shown you. Thank you. So Klaus, just before we move to the early bird questions, um, have you done any work with um, the Rivers Institute and Professor David Hamilton? Who did it yeah. Because so, they've got that global lake monitoring network that he presented on. I would have thought they'd be fantastic baseline data for you to use. And that was across hundreds and hundreds of lakes globally. Yeah, so that's Gleon. Um, so we're working together with David. Um, uh, there's also a little bit more uh, going on probably in the future together with... Uh, a project David uh, and also Sarah are involved with in forecasting water quality parameters, uh, which is um, based in uh, Virginia Tech University, funded by the National Science Foundation of the US. Um, they take that into account. So that that's, as you said, that that's an invaluable source of information, data information, where we can train those those models. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much for that. We better move to questions. Um, we've only got a fairly short amount of time for questions today because a few people have to leave um, in about uh, 15 minutes. So let's get into it. Question number one, as a driller installing dozens of monitoring wells a year, how can we get involved and suggest sites? I think it's about groundwater, this one. You're not really into groundwater yet, are you? No, not yet. Uh, I think um, having having said that, I think we are also getting quite a bit of interest from uh, remote rural communities who have to rely on groundwater for their drinking water. And um, we might bring that into aqua white in due course, but we have to find a way to, to, to put sensors and be able to predict that. It, into those water um, drilling tubes and the and the, the the tubes that come out of and provide that the groundwater for drinking, as well. So um, yeah, at the moment it's mostly surface water and coastal water we're focusing on, but uh, yeah, certainly that's something we can think about in the future as well. I I think I should have probably also mentioned that I mean you've seen all the issues we still have to solve and the complexities of, of the system we're trying to model. We're not gonna jump and provide AquaWatch service right away. So, I mean, we our goal is to have a number of the pilot sites well uh, tested and, and doing some of the modeling in about 2026. Um, and hopefully gradually increase the coverage of AquaWatch to the whole continent from then onwards. So we're, we're, we're being realistic in, in the fact that we're really trying to do something very, very complicated, but hopefully with big impact if we make it work. Absolutely. Um, so I think you've answered question two during the presentation. Um, was there anything further you wanted to add to that? Um, I think I could. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Tim. Sorry. Yeah, I think I thought I could say something here. I think certainly the plan is to be able to offer information at different levels. As Alex ind indicated, you know, there are a number of sort of apps or applications that we envisage some of the outputs of this data on. And some of those would be to a level, um, let's say, of community interests or, or um, you know, Perhaps the individual who wants to know, you know, I want to want to take my family water skiing on this reservoir. Is there an algal bloom uh, present, yeah. etc.? You know, something like that. I think another way we're really keen to engage is through the development of citizen science. Um, so, and that's a really good way of way of, way of um, engaging a community, um, not only in contributing data to this um, to AquaWatch itself, but also in in 
are raising their awareness of water quality issues in their local areas. You're talking about water watch. Think, water watch. Things like things like that. Yes, we we are developing a uh, another app which is called Eye on Water, which uses uh, the mobile phone camera to measure the color of water, and from that color, we can relate that to essentially. Uh, a, a relationship with water quality let's put it that way so that's another way everybody carries a mobile device these days and so it's a very easy way for us to capture data and to, and to encourage people to be thinking about you know what does this water body what does this water look like you know does it look does it look swimmable or or uh is it green or is it turbid um and is it brown etc yeah Excellent. Uh, question three, how does the forecast perform? What is the data requirement in developing this forecasting system? Very hard question to answer. Um, <laughs> of course, as many data as possible, because the more data you have, uh, the, the, the smaller the uncertainty becomes. Um, there are some some basic uh, requirements um, for modeling this for for pure modeling uh, you, you need of course several seasons of, of data to um, to calibrate your your model if you then go um, to to scale up um, to try to transfer that to other systems then you have to imagine a single season will not be a, a, a enough because there will be different geoclimatic regions where you want to apply that. Uh, so you have to expand that over, let's say, multiple seasons uh, and multiple locations. Uh, and then that increases, of course, the ne necessity of, of more data for that, uh, not only by adding up uh, different stations, but also increasing the size, the length of those data uh, to, to be able to forecast that on a more global um, term hmm. question number four is this approach likely to be able to accurately check on inshore turbidity in tropical areas satellite oh. versus in situ sensing yeah i can have a crack at that uh, yes this is certainly an aspiration so you know csiro has a has a sort of a 20 25 year history in the development of water quality monitoring tools using satellites uh, for, for water quality, particularly focused on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so, so our algorithms are, we're confident our algorithms deliver very, uh, very good data for that. Um, we are not far off the production of a kind of continental scale um, turbidity or suspended sediment map for Australia. That's going to be at fairly coarse scale based on on MODIS data, of course, I mean one kilometer data. Uh, it's, a, it's a machine learning algorithm that we are just trial. We're going to roll out as a trial, essentially. Um, uh, so you know, and our plan is, our intention is to really do this for all, for all of Australia. In terms of in-water sensing, we we don't have much north of um, north of the Fitzroy. Uh, we have one installation near Townsville at Lucinda Jetty. Um, so there is a lot of the lot of the north that could yet be instrumented in in coastal areas. That's certainly an aspiration, um, uh, but but yes, uh, you know, ultimately we we want us uh, we want Aqua Watch to be able to produce um, outputs at, at as high a frequency as possible and as high a spatial re resolution as possible for the entire for the entire coastal coastal uh, coast of Australia. Why is it um, why is it so coarse? This uh, one kilometer grid. That, um, it, yeah, initially it's it, but it, you're rolling something out at, at high spatial resolution across something, you know, something with a thirty six thousand kilometer coastline is is a lot of data basically, and so this is, this is really just a trial, um, and this this data is very. Is uh, MODIS data is just available from NASA, and it's a it's a twenty year time series from two thousand and two. Um, so it's a very good one to develop these tools initially on to see, you know, is 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 this actually going to work? Is it reliable? Is it accurate? It gives us a test, and then we can begin to think about how do we roll it out to a higher um, higher spatial resolution sensors. It'll be interesting to see um, how this gets applied in the future, like.
trying to look at the effectiveness of land use change in catchments and things. It could be yeah. Well useful, I mm. think. Um, number five, how will, could this link in with existing real-time monitoring already in place? Mm. So um, I could have a crack at this, and this relates to questions five, six, and nine, I think are all. Uh, are all quite similar. As I stated in my my section of the talk, you know, we're very interested to hearing from different groups who have have existing real time monitoring in place um, uh, that we could contribute to that um, to that survey we're currently undertaking um, of of existing networks. And so we'd be very keen to hear from people uh, who have those in place. Um, and as I said, our our intention is not to. Not to reinvent the wheel here. Certainly not. Not planning to come in ourselves and and install sensors when 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 there is perfectly adequate sensing technologies and probably better sensing technologies employed um, already. This is better really you know really a compliment. <laughs> yes, that too, Richard. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, in terms of <laughs> lost track of my question. Actually, apologies. I'm going to move on. <laughs> Um, the next, so you, you've sort of gobbled up a couple of questions there. Mm. Discuss the CSIRO's ADIAS platform if possible. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, it's it's a it's um, a DS or ADS system as we're calling it now, a large data system is basically the 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 big cloud computing infrastructure platform that's bringing all these different data sets together to pro and eventually pro uh, also run the modeling, the forecasting, uh, using ingesting a lot of satellite data as well as in situ data that's hopefully coming in um, almost in near real time into the system as it's, it's, it, as it's churning the, the data and doing the forecast. Um, we run the system at the moment using Amazon Web Services, so it's massive cloud computing infrastructure, um, where the system uh, is been implemented using um, uh, Python notebooks. If for those of you who are into into sort of big data analytics, it's it's the language that is used a lot for this. It's most of it is open source, um, and uh, it allows you also to visualize the results at the same time with the right routines on, the, on when you write these programs. Um, what else can I say? It does cost us to run the system because we have to pay the the computing costs to to the cloud pr uh, computing provider. But my, our analysis uh, and those of others before us um, suggest that running a lot of this big data ingestion and crunching on the cloud seems to be much more cost effective than spending uh, uh, tens of millions of dollars on a supercomputer that you uh, may have to replace um, every five or 10 years um, or upgrade, whereas the cloud is constantly being upgraded, right? And we, the other thing is the benefit of this system is it can run on any part of the world effectively because it runs on the cloud and it taps into global data that we can access from NASA and the European Space Agency. So tomorrow we might have a project funded by the Gates Foundation in Africa or something like that. And it's quite quite easy to uh, set up a system that does just that. So that gives us that flexibility. But if people are really, really interested in sort of deep, deep tech uh, cloud computing, we'll, we can definitely set up a a separate um, webinar just on that topic uh, with our data experts. Okay. Um, there's a question there about groundwater quality in mining areas. Is there anything that's um, specific to mining that you haven't already covered? Uh, just water quality in general rather than groundwater, I suppose. Yeah. yeah so yeah, go ahead, Klaus. Um, so Alex already mentioned, um, if it's water quality, it's about the water quality sensors, which you would need to, to have um, 
there to, to do any significant water quality modeling forecasting. However, um, there are several, um, well, there is the possibility that you, you can monitor uh, groundwater, surface water interactions by uh, looking at changes uh, in, the, in, the, in the water quality, in the, in the, in the color of the water you can see. And especially in the mining industry sector, there is, um, if you're not looking directly at, let's say, um, metal contamination uh, in terms of drinking water concentrations, but in terms of um, what's the, the effect of, let's say, um, the through flow from groundwater through tailings uh, and then into the river, which brings, let's say, metal compounds into the river, which oxidize, and these oxidation products, they, they're really colorful, and you can see them from spice. So you can, could monitor tailing dams relatively easily. Um, mm -hmm. um, but you also could uh, look at, let's say, the potential breaks of tailing dams, uh, because you could see the color changes in, in the downstream rivers. So that that that's a possibility which we can already do or could already do with the existing aquatic system or the remote sensing part. Uh, yeah, and um, I think there is quite a bit of interest in you developing similar sort of sort of novel sensors. I think for heavy metal detection in the field, um, but I guess we're not there yet. But it'd be fantastic to partner with some some of those online. Uh, if, if there's an interest in, in working with us on some of those applications. I think there'd be a huge amount of interest in that from the mm -hmm. people involved with compliance monitoring alike. Um, mm -hmm. Before we go any further, you were going to, there's a, you're having a meeting to bring together potential partners and things. I think Mark wanted us to just mention that. The, the... Yes, we do. We do because I think, um, well, and, and something that perhaps wasn't clear in our presentation is we, we, the ambition is to make a lot of this data available, like you have data from the Bureau of Meteorology, freely available. It's a public, as a public funded service, right? But the, we see a lot of potential for the data to be value added further for specific industry sectors or specific applications where, where we probably think that private industry should go or is already involved with. So we want to bring a lot of those uh, companies and, and potential users and value adding uh, uh, ser data service providers into a meeting that uh, we're also coordinating uh, and trying to set up in the next few months uh, just to have that conversation. How can we then make the data available and what, what can people use it? Is it useful? That sounds good. So how do they find out about the, the meeting and if they want to attend? We'll, we'll, how about we um, we'll forward it, the invite to you, Richard, and uh, Hydro-Terra, and you then distribute it to, to those who might be interested. Is, would that work? I think so. So we could circulate it out to the people who've um, yep. enrolled in this webinar as, as a starting point and then... If the people yeah. listening feel there's other people who might be interested, they could forward it on to them. Yeah, and we'll let, and uh, yeah, Mark, Mark Bowdery would be the point of contact for that. And I think he's online as well. Okay. Um, now I was conscious that a couple of you had to leave about uh, 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, we've got 12 questions left. I think we're... Probably going to just have to do a lucky dip on, say, one of them um, and respond to these other questions by email, I would suggest is the best way to go. Um, so maybe we can pick, goodness, maybe the first one. Casey Price, is there plans to expand the location of in situ sensor packs? I'm sure they are expensive. But if not, is there an opportunity for local river lovers to fundraise for an in situ sensor in their local river? 
We are really seeing the power of local communities who care for their rivers right now. And I believe this would be possible if you would be open to expanding the network. That's a good idea. Yeah, good idea. Um, I think um, definitely um, we have sort of a, an optimal sensor pack list of the sort of sensors that that, uh, that we would need and that Klaus, for instance, would need for his modeling, um, some of which are useful for validating the satellite signal, but also measuring things we can't see from space, of course, as Klaus was saying. So um, we would be happy to at least pass on that list and, you know, the the data analytics people, the ideas team is constantly trying to figure out how do you stream sensors from different vendors into AquaWide. So we're not we're not going to be recommending a, a type of brand necessarily, but the type of measurement that would be useful. Um, and uh, happy to yeah have that conversation. And Tim and his team probably would be very interested in in collaborating with you on that and creating. A much bigger network of sensors across Australia. Yeah, I think if you can um, formalize that specification for the bundle of sensor types, yeah, and, and you know the accuracy, etc., that you're needing, that yep. would be really powerful. We'd love to be involved in sort of helping to promote that. That's for sure. Okay. Yeah, we'll pass that on definitely. Um. I need to go to catch an aeroplane and others need to leave. They're meant to have left. Um, I suggest we respond to these other um, questions um, by email. But um, thank you very much to everyone who's attended today. It's been fantastic. And thank you very much to our presenters. Really impressed with what Cyro's taking on here it's a very big challenge but a, a fantastic one to be taking on so really appreciate the three of you presenting today it's been really informative and great to see so many people here as well so thank you to you and sorry we couldn't get through all the questions today thanks very much for the invite and thanks everybody for the questions and the engagement uh, look forward to talking to you a bit more Thanks, guys. Thank all you. Right. Thank bye you bye. all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.